Tot i que ja la coneixeu, i segurament l'heu llegit, quatre notes sobre Zadie Smith. Va publicar la seva primera novel·la quan tenia 25 anys, Dents Blanques, i des d'aleshores ha anat vestint una obra molt sòlida que jo crec que es relaciona sobretot la part novel·lística amb un llibre amb l'altre, amb El caçador d'autògrafs, després sobre la bellesa, Northwest, que aquí es va traduir com Northwest London, i ara aquesta última novel·la que es diu Swing Time, Temps de Swing, i que serà una mica l'eix central de la conversa d'avui. A part, us vull recomanar molt també un llibre d'assajos que va publicar que es diu Changing My Mind, Changing My Mind, Canviar la idea. Tots aquests llibres en castellà estan publicats a Salamanda, els tres primers en català, la Magrana. Sorprenentment hi ha algun editor que s'ha despistat i no ha publicat els dos últims. So English writers tend to think, and I, I was totally guilty of this, that the third person is in some way um, morally elevated, you know? Mm -hmm. That you're taking this high uh, objective position on a situation, judging many fine differences in character situation, and always being fair. I think that's very important, you know, this mm -hmm. idea of fairness. Um, and what I like about the first person is that it's, it's not fair. The first person is entirely subjective, um, everything is filtered through this voice, um, and this voice in this case can be cruel, unfair, biased, vain, deluded. Um, that seems to be much more close to the reality of our lives, you know. Um, we'd all like to think of ourselves as, as George Eliot. I'm sure even George Eliot wanted to think of himself as George Eliot. <laughs> but in, in reality, you have to move through the world in the first person, and I, I was quite interested in in not being fair, yeah. In this case, because her personality, the coldness of it, and, and the distance. I, I was always trying to shift the emphasis away from whether so-and-so is nice or nasty to structural <coughs> problems. You know, for example, I, I, uh, earlier we were talking in a press conference about Amy, and the emphasis, people want to put an emphasis, I guess, on the idea that she's a vain, ridiculous pop star, and she shouldn't be doing these things in, in Africa. But to me, that's less interesting than the question, how does an individual person come to be richer than an entire country? And that's not a question about personality. That's a question about economic structures in the world. And that's the bit which interests me. Not, I don't have an idea of, of human personality that it can be perfected. I think everybody is more or less a dickhead one way or another. Um, and given that that's the case, you want to try and structure society which allows people to indulge that part of their personality as little as possible. I remember um, something Namakov said about never being as intense a reader as he was between the ages of 10 and 15. It wasn't possible to read like he did in those five years. And that is my experience, that, that it has a certain intensity. It doesn't, obviously your life has, takes on a much weightier meaning as you get older. Um, but so much of life, more than you could have ever imagined when you were a teenager, turns out to be uh, administrative, uh, polite, banal. Um, and what passes for friendship in adult life seems to me often a very uh, thin thing, you know, compared to the kind of friendships you have when you're young. Mm -hmm. And someone like Ferrante, I think her effect is only will be enormous, and it's just, this is just the beginning of it, releases in women writers the idea that their material, their lives, even the smallest, most domestic parts of their lives, have weight and have interest. I think that's a, an enormous gift to a whole generation of women writers, and I feel very lucky to have written um, in the wake of her. 
I don't describe things like that because my reader is a cyborg. It doesn't mean it's the end of literature. It just opens up new avenues. It's much more about positioning and structure in a novel. I'm totally aware every point that my reader will look up those videos and that, and that when they look at the image with my work, something will happen. Um, it, it is like description, but it's also like uh, pointing almost. And I'm very, uh, I, I love that about my reader. It took me a while to uh, recognize it and to understand it, but if, you don't, if you're not aware that that's your reader, you're going to be writing redundantly a lot of the time. And I don't find anything um, less literary about that exchange. To me, it, it's beautiful, that conjunction. That I can make an argument about what it feels like to watch Michael Jackson do the moonwalk, and then my reader can go and see if, if I'm right, or if the way I described it, it echoes with their feeling as they watch him. So I, I completely um, expected that as I wrote, and I, I do that when I read. I do that all the time, I'm always Googling. It's interesting, for my birthday I went to the um, Carlisle this year, it's a hotel uptown, to hear Cabaret, you know, and it was a, a girl who's in Hamilton, great singer. Um, there was a funny sense in which she was too good, and I've seen that quite a lot in Cabaret, a perfect voice with extraordinary range, and but the audience is left a little cold by it. Um, there are so many other aspects to singing than singing well, if you see what I mean. And it's a very important lesson to learn as a singer, and some people never learn it because it's, it's counterintuitive. You feel like, well, if I can sing so perfectly and so well, what's the problem? But, but listeners are looking for something more than uh, perfection. And I think writing is, is a very similar matter, you know. The technically perfect writing um, is, for me, a slightly deadening thing, you know. And I think it's some, not that I'm a technically perfect writer, but I was trained the way I was educated to believe that um, in a, a very kind of high perfection in writing, writers like the Bokko, for example. Um, and I think as I've got older, I find that kind of uh, perfection chilly, you know. The feminism I grew up in, it seems as natural as breathing to me. So what was, what was odd to me when I got to college and met um, younger people, and then when I went, started teaching and met young students is how anxious they were about their feminism and they, they wanted to make clear that it was still sexy and still fun. And I was like, I don't give a stab with sexy or fun. It never occurred to me, those arguments were of no interest to me, you know. Um, so it's weird watching the generation uh, change. I, I grew up in an environment that was explicitly feminist, not only all my friends but all our mothers and everybody we knew. It, it, it was, wasn't a question. And I, we never thought about making it um, palatable or presentable to men, or it, it didn't occur to me. So I, I think it's it's a kind of age gap thing, and I I do rather keep out of contemporary feminist arguments because I feel very distant from them for the most part. Um, I think the first thing I want to say is that, that point that Wittgenstein makes about you. The limits of your thought are the limits of your language. So the problem with using the phrase cultural appropriation is immediately we get into this banal discussion in which there's almost no point in us having it because everybody knows either side of this debate and blah 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 and the various incidents you can use. But but cultural appropriation is not my it's borrowed secondhand language we're all using to describe a multitude of different phenomena and it traps the argument in this tedious back and forth in which uh, I have, one of my main objections to it is in which I am cast as an other, as uh, someone you can steal culture from. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, you as a white male subject, I can't appropriate you apparently because you don't have culture, you're just a human. Mm -hmm. So when I write a character like Howard in On Beauty, a 62 year old white man, I have not appropriated white culture apparently, that is impossible. I can't steal from you, you can only steal from me. Mm -hmm. So the structural relation is annoying and by talking about it where you just keep on repeating the same power relation between us. So I object to it from that point of view. Um, and then I, I would use the word, in terms of what I do, voyeurism. I would absolutely and explicitly admit to being a voyeur, that is somebody who wants to be in other people's business and in their lives, and sometimes in their skin. I've been in the skin of many different people, races, nationalities, genders, 
one of my explicit desires when I started writing as a child was to be a man for 10 pages, to be an old woman for 10 pages. I wanted to be somebody else. So I'm absolutely um, willing to take the, uh, whatever it is, pathological category of voyeur. That is what I am by instinct, by practice, by work. That's what I do. Um, so I, I think it's also possible to object to that tendency in people, but you have to recognize that uh, voyeurism is what animates actors and writers. That is our job. And it has historically been our job. And I, I like to think that we perform some kind of service by being uh, not very firm in our own identities or personalities, which I think we can confess, and most writers are of this kind, and actors for sure. By having this um, disconnected sense of ourselves, we allow other people who I completely understand feel strongly about their identities and their personalities to, for a moment, imagine what it would be like not to feel that way. I think people want that release very much. They're born into a certain place, they're a certain color. They want to imagine what it would be like not to feel very strongly about Catalan independence or not to feel very strongly about being British. They want to know for a moment what it would be like not to be that person. Actors, historically, going back thousands of years, have provided you with that moment of escape from your particular situation, the particularities of your life. It's called catharsis. So I don't think we really want that to go away forever. I mean, you can give it a try, see how we all do. But I, I think we need it. Uh, it's a necessity. That's separate from, oh, I went to a party dressed as a Mexican, or I went. These are all separate issues. You cannot gather them all under a phrase called cultural appropriation and have a stupid argument about it. There is art, there is writing, there is film, there are individual acts of imaginative uh, identification which might be important. And then there's also some dickhead who dressed up as a rapper and went to a party on the camera. That's a separate case. But my problem with the public debate at the moment is that there is no distinction between the artist who is trying to identify imaginatively with somebody to the fool who went to the frat party. You can't make distinctions. You can't even have a discussion. You can't even speak. So unfortunately, on a stage like this, we can unpick these things and have an adult conversation. But most of the time online, there's not time to say what I just said or even to get into it. And so we're left with, you know, you wore my bindi or how dare you have dreadlocks. Or, <laughs> it's exhausting, that stuff. But I, I don't think it's even worth engaging with. It's so stupid. Don't blame any black subject in America who is sensitive or uh, distressed by the idea of their culture being appropriated or stolen. The history of America is the appropriation of black culture. Black. The stealing of it, the selling of it, the ridiculing of it, the debasing of it. That history is so long, you can't expect the people to forget about that overnight. And if they're hypersensitive, they have good reason. Um, it's a long, bitter, bloody case in which, I mean, even thinking of contemporary pop music, when I <coughs> grew up, how many times did you see black music either fronted by white singers with black people somewhere in the distance in the back video songs literally ripped out of the culture and represented to some good-looking kid like Bieber or whatever to sing it that's very painful it's been painful for decades so you can't minimize that kind of um theft but um but there is also exchange and there also is love and voyeurism the relationship for instance between uh, Jewish songwriters and black musicians in the 30s and 40s. That, you can call it appropriation or you can call it a love affair. It's an obsession. Um, and it's between two peoples. I don't say they get on all the time or there's a peaceful relation, but it's a very profound relationship. What Gershwin did with black music, is that appropriation? Is Porgy and Bess appropriation or is it the case of a, a Jewish man deeply in love with black music to the point of wanting to be inside it? And would black audiences now want Porky and Bess unplayed or, or not to exist? I, I find that an incredible idea. And also, there's so much hypocrisy in it. Like when I wrote White Teeth, I don't remember anybody saying I had appropriated Bengali culture. Why? Because from a white point of view, well, you're brown, they're brown, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> that was basically the bottom line. There was no difference. They're all brown. Yeah. She can write about what she likes because she's brown, so she knows brown people. <laughs> I don't know anything more about Bengali than I know about Catalans or anybody. It's the same distance, but I was curious and I wanted to know. And I made a lot of mistakes, I'm sure. And I still have Bengali readers who will tell me you made this mistake, that mistake. Um, but, but that's the risk. You make mistakes. Or I can just write about books about people like just me, 
42 year old mixed race women and that's it for the rest of my life. I can do that. <laughs> or I can take these various risks and risk being wrong. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to make a mistake about someone's culture, to use the wrong term. They'll tell you everybody gets over it, you know? There's no more to wounding in that situation.